Welcome back. You're watching HFO TV. Hi, welcome back to HFO TV. I'm Greg Frick, partner at HFO Investment Real Estate. Today we have Charles Kovas again, partner at Warner Allen, going to talk a little bit about the legislative changes in landlord tenant law for the state of Washington. Thanks for coming back again. Thanks for having me, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. Why don't we give a little update on uh, some of the changes that we came in place in the last uh, session in the state of Washington? Because I know a lot of our owners own in both states and are always curious, kind of, we, we can highlight too some of the differences in Oregon and Washington. Well, sure. As you know, there's been a lot of emphasis in both Oregon and yes. Washington about affordable housing. Definitely. And both Portland and Vancouver have had attempts to create local ordinance, ordinances uh, that work in addition to or uh, concordantly with state laws. Right. And in Washington, they had a couple of bills that specifically addressed landlord tenant issues. And then they had another bill which affected basically the ability of a tenant to get professional licensing because getting professional licensing and advancing one's own career, they believe is sort of the key to advancing one's own life and okay. getting stable housing and stable community involvement. That bill was 1553 and in essence what it did was it created a process where someone with a criminal record could seek a certificate of restoration uh, and if they have been off of probation or away from sentencing for a certain amount of time, either one year for a low-level misdemeanor, five years for uh, most non-serious right. felonies, uh, then much like in other states, they're getting kind of an expungement. Uh, but what it does in this circumstance is it takes the crime off their record so that they can apply for professional licensing. Landlords are not required to accept that certificate of restoration. Now the process is in flux and it could be something that landlords are required to accept down the road, but at the moment the process is just, just to help people clear the decks Got to it. move forward uh, with their own professional endeavors. So would that be on their record? Or so if a landlord runs a criminal check, is it off their record or is it shows that it's a sponge that they're moving forward to get it taken off? Well, my understanding is it's short of expungement. It still exists okay. on their record, okay. but they have this certificate of restoration, Got it. which is in essence that intermediary step. Right. And again, it's to, to allow them to get professional licensing and move forward in their career so that they can then become more stable right. on other fronts, professionally, personally, uh, within the community and so forth. So is that, well, from a Washington owner standpoint, is that going to limit uh, you know, being able to say we're not taking, you know, felons of certain classes, or is that? In the short run, no, and I've got the okay. bill in front of me. It specifically provides uh, that landlords are not required to accept the certificate of restoration. Got it. Okay, so you could still have that as a requirement or a hurdle that had to be crossed, you know, having a clean record or having a non-felon uh, as a tenant, so to speak, as a way to deny tenants. That's right. Got it. The other changes were much more direct uh, towards landlord-tenant rules. Uh, first, in Washington, they extended the time frame for sending a final accounting from 14 days to 21 days. So when your tenant moves out, Got it. you need to go through your ledger, figure out right. how much of their security deposit you have, if you have a first and last month's rent, or any other funds belonging to the tenant. And under the old law, within 14 days, you needed to send that final accounting by first class mail to the tenant, to the tenant, to their last known address, or to any forwarding address. The change is that that's been extended to 21 days. So that really is a benefit to the landlord. Right. Now, to be clear, if the damages go up, you know, you've just gotten the premises back, you get in there, you're able to take some of the siding off and find out that there's a problem. Well, you can still go to court and say, in between the time we sent the final accounting and in between the time we get before the judge, we've discovered additional damages. That doesn't change. This is primarily a notice requirement to the So landlord. you just have more time now to give the notice to the tenant. That's right. Right. What's the organs? Oregon is 31 days. 31 days from the time the tenant moves out to do a final accounting. Yep, and right. again, send it by first class mail to right. the last known address or any forwarding address. So that's one of the changes, and, and this bill was Senate Bill 
6413. It extended that final accounting change by a week, and then it also tries to expand a comprehensive reusable tenant screening. And it, it, it's interesting. If you think about a tenant who is trying to move and is right. having to pay screening fees at a dozen different right. apartments, the tenant can, at their own expense, get a comprehensive reusable screening. And it's got to be current within the last 30 days. And it's got to uh, talk okay. about their criminal history. And it's got to talk about their eviction history. And it's got to talk about their rental history. But the landlord can accept that history in lieu of charging a tenant for a separate individual screening. So they're not, in theory, not having to go pay seven different screening fees That's for right. seven different owners. If the landlord wants to do their own separate screening, they right. can, but they can't charge the tenant for that. If the tenant has the... That's right. And if the landlord's willing to accept it. If the landlord is willing to accept it, they need to put it in their application materials or they need to put it on their website Got it. that they do accept the comprehensive reusable tenant screening. And again, the purpose here is that it be portable and it help tenants not have to suffer right. the cost. Multiple screening fees for multiple buildings. That's right. Interesting. Okay. Is there something like that in Oregon? The, no. 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 It, generally, this is the first time I've come across it, but then again, these are the only two states I'm licensed in. Right. So. And isn't the state of Washington have a source of income protection? I know that's been in Oregon. That, didn't that come in this last uh, session as well? That's right. That's one of the new changes. Okay. The state of Washington has established the source of income as kind of what we call a protected class. Got it. So normally, a landlord will say there needs to be a certain amount of income ratio to the rent. Right, to qualify. So, that's right. So for example, if the rent's $1,000 a month, the tenant needs to make $3,000 a month exactly. in order to qualify. The source of income protection says if the tenant has a voucher or a subsidy for some amount of their rent, the landlord can only use the tenant's portion of the rent in that ratio. So to put it another way, the landlord can't discriminate against where the money's coming from. If the voucher is for $600 and the tenant's portion is for $400, well then the source of income leads to $1,000 right. being available for the rent. For the ratio. And That's right. So when the landlord does that multiplier, they're only supposed to multiply the tenant's portion. So if they normally do Got three it. to one, and now the tenant's portion is only $400, well, the tenant only needs to make $1,200 to qualify. to qualify. Got it. So this is designed to bring Washington uh, into agreement with many of the other Western states that also protects against source of income discrimination and make it clear that low-income tenants have the ability to qualify uh, for places they can afford, regardless of where the money's coming right, Based on some assistance they have, that part gets pulled out of the rent and we're only qualifying on what tenant themselves are having to pay. That's right. Right. Interesting. Okay. Uh, the, the, the last change would limit certain eviction records from being discoverable, or not necessarily discoverable, but from being the types of eviction records that a tenant can be denied for. So in some cases, in uh, Clark County in particular, we'll have a situation where the tenant comes to the landlord after a case has started and comes to a settlement agreement and then the tenancy is reinstated okay or you have a situation where somehow i don't know exactly how it would work because the statute's written after the fact but it reads as if it's determined that the case was brought in bad faith or wasn't a credible case in either of those two circumstances, bad faith case or the tenancy was reinstated, the tenant can get an order limiting the disclosure of that eviction record. So just a curiosity on how that works, if the tenant gets that order, is that going to the, does it go to the agency that's producing the criminal record? I mean, how does, does he walk around with this order saying, I would suspect, you yeah. Pulled my, you pulled my credit report and you pulled my you know, criminal history, I have an eviction, but oh, here's an order that, you know, 
Why would that suspect, out? yeah, oh, that they okay. would have to have that order? Because again, when we're talking about the difference between these types of orders and an expungement, right? If something's expunged, it's just not there. You don't see it at all. That's right. You call your screening company, and they say, "I'm not seeing a conviction right. in 2013." So I would suspect that here it still exists, but it either won't be disclosed, or if it is disclosed, the tenant has to show that order that limits. Uh, that order from being used as a denial a is it correct yes so the landlord's going to have is not going to have the ability with that order to make a judgment oh he has that you know it's now off his record but i still want to deny for that he's going to have to find other reasons or i mean gives more protection to that tenant i'd imagine who has that on there it does and the other thing is a lot of times tenants are in a situation where they feel like they don't have many options right. and I think both of these changes, whether or not you are limiting certain bad faith prior evictions, if that finding has been made, right. or you're trying to limit excess transaction costs, both of these changes were put into place to assist tenants in finding new housing because we all know the supply of housing is so limited. Right. I guess a question of this out of in terms of if you've heard, you know, down in California, they're talking about, you know, limiting the amount of things a landlord can use in terms of criminal background uh, because it's discriminatory in certain classes. Is that something you're seeing up here as a push to where we've got tenant groups saying we don't want, you know, the landlord to be limited to certain types of crimes that can be used as... Certainly in Oregon, that's the case. Yeah. In Oregon, certain felonies that are more than five years old can't be used at all. At all. But if it's a sex crime or a crime that is attendant to the landlord tenancy, for example, I don't know, someone Property drove their damage. car into right. a parking spot and destroyed the overhang, uh, those types of felonies could be used against the tenant. Uh, in Washington, under the new law, they do have some similar limitations and they're they allow the landlord to continue to exclude serious violent felonies sex crimes, uh, certain crimes involving dishonesty, Got it, okay. uh, but generally they have to be within the last five years. Okay. Uh, and generally, again, the tenant can get this order limiting dissemination of those records or in the professional context get that certificate of restoration, which I would fully expect in the next few years may be something that landlords are asked to consider as a right. mandatory requirement as well. Right, is that, if you have that restoration certificate, that's gonna that's right. override anything that's on the, on the background check in terms of what it's related to. And we would assume that that would happen because one of the real problems here is all these rules that are being put in place really don't do a lot to increase the availability of affordable housing. They don't create more units. No. And one of the things they do is they create more transaction costs for the landlords, more hoops to, for the landlords to jump through. Right. And that may be contributing to the increase in rents that we're seeing across the board all over the area. Right. Unfortunately, we're going to have to wait and see how that happens, how it plays out. Right. Well, we, you know, we've talked about it with other groups as well. It's, you know, you can address, you can address the, if you don't address the supply side, um, in terms of getting new product, I mean that's you know it's economics, you know supply and demand, and we're always dealing with the uh, you know the demand side issues and you know transaction costs and things, like that, which is great. I think that's going to help, but you also have to address the supply side. If we don't get more supply, you have the same amount of demand, prices are going to go up, and I think you know that's going to be the. And we haven't done that yet. Not at all. All we're doing now yes. in the legislature is trying to make it a little bit easier right. for the landlords and the tenants to follow their obligations under the law. Right. Well, thanks again for coming. That was very enlightening. And we'll see you next time on HFO TV. My thanks. pleasure. Happy to be here. Thank you. Our entire office specializes in multifamily real estate, making HFO the largest multifamily brokerage in the Pacific Northwest. Your success is our passion. Build your legacy with HFO. Call 503-241-5541 or visit our website at hfore.com for more information.